Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College and coming to you today with a video uh, follow up from our first video on learning. The first one, an introduction to learning and uh, basically of classical conditioning. And today we'll do a little bit of review of classical conditioning and compare it with operant conditioning and then go into a more in-depth discussion of operant conditioning. So here we go. All right, so classical conditioning, as you learned in the last video, involves making an association between two stimuli or two events that occur uh, back to back consistently. So for example, the experiments of Eric Candle with the sea snails in which the snail learned to associate receiving a splash of water with a tail shock such that eventually just being splashed by water caused the snail to uh, respond to uh, that with the same action that they would to the tail shock. So notice here we have an association between two events that occur consistently together. In operant conditioning, which we're going to go into more today, we'll find that the association in our nervous system is one between um, a certain behavior that is performed and then the consequence that that behavior brings about. And so as an example, the seal balances a ball on its nose and as a consequence, it is given a fish uh, which it delights in eating and then the response of balancing the ball is strengthened as a result of its consequence. So different kinds of scenarios. In classical conditioning that we studied last time, the behaviors that we see are called respondent behaviors. And so the organism is responding to one event as if it were another. So the uh, Pavlov's dog is responding to the tone as if it's food being placed in its mouth and salivating uh, to that tone, uh, even though there's no food present, respondent behavior. In operant conditioning, what we have is what we call operant behavior. The behavior here is the organism operating on its environment to produce various consequences. So operant conditioning, operant behavior. In classical conditioning, we studied last time, the learner is a passive learner. The two things just happen to them, they're just there. And the organism is not doing anything, they're simply receiving those two events. On the other hand, in operant conditioning, as we'll see today, the organism is an active learner and is engaging with its environment to produce various consequences. So operant conditioning starts out with that organism doing something to influence its environment. In operant conditioning also, we will see trial and error type behaviors, trial and error er learning. So the person or animal trying this to get the result that they want and then trying that if it doesn't work. In operant conditioning also we'll see that these actions then produce either reward, what we'll refer to as reinforcement or punishment. So let's start to have a closer look at operant conditioning. And one of the first to study that in this part of the world was Edward Thorndike back in early 1900s. Um, Thorndike had lots of cats available and to investigate this thing that we now call operant learning, he would take a hungry cat and place it in this puzzle box that he had built. It was just kind of a crate with um, a door that could be opening, opened by depressing a pedal. So you put a hungry cat in there, put some food outside. And of course, what will a cat do under these circumstances? It wants to get the food. 
So it's going to try various things to escape the box. And it doesn't really know what it has to do to get out of there. So it just tries your basic cat types of stuff like sticking its paws through the slats, maybe bumping into the sides and maybe trying to jump and nothing happens. And then at some point the cat accidentally steps on the pedal and that causes the door to open and out goes the cat to get the food. Well, what Thorndike found is that the more times that he put the cat under inside this box, um, the faster the cat would go to step on that pedal. And as you can see, with more and more successive trials in the puzzle box, eventually the cat got to the point where it literally would just go right over there, step on the pedal, and out it goes to get the food. And oh, by the way, here's how his puzzle box actually looked. Not quite as nice as our little picture, right? So Thorndike then proposed what he called the law of effect uh, from what he observed. And this stated that behavior that is rewarded, producing a rewarding consequence, is likely to occur again in the future. So basically what he was saying is that behavior that produced the uh, reward is going to um, be strengthened. So B.F. Skinner then was another behaviorist that came along who was very interested in this type of learning. And so to study operant conditioning then, he devised a little fancier apparatus, as you can see in the pictures, that we now call the operant chamber, or sometimes it will be called the Skinner box. So that thing was an enclosure appropriate for whatever sort of animal you might be putting in there. And then it would have a number of features. So the operant chamber would have some sort of um, stimulus that the animal could act upon. So if you had a rat, maybe you'd have a lever there that the rat could learn to press. If you had a pigeon, you might have a disc there that the pigeon could peck at. You also would have some way of dispensing reinforcement, what you might think of as a reward. Um, this might be a dispenser by which you could, um, could administer food pellets or it might be a water dispenser in the case that you're putting a thirsty animal in there, okay? And then there might be a couple of other things. There might be other stimuli like a light or a speaker and so on. So Skinner then would put animals such as a rat in there and he'd want the rat to press the lever. He'd want the rat to press the lever though to obtain a food reinforcement. So how is he going to get the rat to do that? Because rats don't just naturally go around pressing levers for food. So I know some students will say, well, maybe he puts some cheese on the lever so that the cat rat would go over there. But then the rat is not going to go to the food dispenser where Skinner wants it to go. So he devised a technique to enable the rat to learn this that has become known as shaping. Shaping then is a technique by which the trainer reinforces actions that are increasingly similar to the target behavior. So each time the animal masters one element of the target behavior, then the level of difficulty is stepped up to the next level. So how did Skinner do this with a rat in the operant chamber? Well, first he would go through a procedure where he would train the rat to recognize when there was food at the dispenser. Now the apparatus would make a clicking sound whenever he would dispense food here. And so what he would do is he would put the rat in there facing the lever or facing the dispenser where the rat could see what was going on and then there would be a click and food would appear. Of course, the rat would grab it and eat it, then he would repeat it. Food or click, food, click, food, click, food, click, food. So 
he's training it to know that when that clicking sound occurred, there's food over there in the dispenser. By the way, what kind of conditioning is he actually using here? Think hard. Ah, if you said, oh, that's the stuff that we were looking at in the last video, classical conditioning, you're correct. Because he was training the rat to associate two stimuli or two events with uh, another. He was training it to uh, associate the clicking sound with the presence of food, food being provided over here. So he used a little classical conditioning to get this going. Then once the rat knew that the clicking sound meant food was available, then he would put the rat into the box facing away from the lever. And he would wait, wait until the rat made any movement towards the lever. As soon as the rat made a movement towards the lever, click, there's the food. Then he would take the rat out of the box, put it in facing away from the lever again. This time he would wait till the rat made a movement towards the lever, but a little bit more the direction of the lever than before. And then click, there's food. Then he would take the rat out, put it back in facing away from the lever. Now the rat doesn't get anything until it turns a quarter turn. Once it makes that quarter tune, click, there's food. Put takes it out, puts it back in. Now he's going to wait until the rat turns a little further, click, there's food, keeps repeating this. And little by little, the rat is required to turn more and more towards that level lever till eventually the rat has turned all the way around to face the lever, click, there's the food. So the next step then, is to put the rat, uh, take the rat out, put it back in, facing away from the lever. It knows what to do and turn us around very quickly and then wait for it to take a step towards the lever. Then click there's food. And then successively each trial, the rat has to move closer to the lever until eventually Skinner has the rat turning around, going straight to the lever and standing there. Now the rat doesn't know what to do for the next step, <laughs> but it's been through a whole bunch of this, and so it just starts to try different things. And eventually, somehow in trying different things, standing near the lever, it bumps into the lever, click, there's food. Take it out, put it back in. It will uh, click that lever, bump into it, and click it sooner. Eventually, with more experience, the rat goes directly to the lever and actually presses the lever uh, to produce the food uh, reinforcement. So that's the basic thing. Now, this is also known as the method of successive approximations. So to consider how one might do this uh, in another scenario, let's have a look at a video that uh, one of my dogs from way back when, and uh, here he is, and this is Thomas. Uh, I think we actually had this on lecture. And so here he is jumping through a hoop. You might wonder, how did I get him to do that? So I did use the method of shaping very heavily in order to get him to do this. And as soon as you've seen the video, I'll tell you how it was done. Notice he's not fully trained yet, but he's getting there. This is a couple of years ago when I weighed 30 more pounds. Yeah, okay. All right. So, all right. So how did I get him to do this? Well, I used shaping. And so the first thing that I did, uh, he already uh, knew that when uh, I said good boy, that meant that he was going to get a little bit of a treat. So I used that rather than a clicker. And so at first, when I showed him that hoop, he was sort of afraid of it. and He kind of avoided it. And so the first thing I did is to uh, give him a treat each time he would look towards the thing. And so pretty soon he was kind of staring at the thing and uh, fixing his gaze on it. And so I waited for him to take the, the next step, which is to actually make some movement towards the direction of the hoop which I held uh, against the floor uh, at floor level. And uh, so as soon as he moved in that direction, he got a treat. 
then, uh, then after that, he had to move uh, more steps towards it. And then uh, the next step was that he had to uh, actually go and approach it uh, and stand by it. And then once he was standing by it and had gotten his treat for that, he looked around, didn't know what to do, tried different things, and eventually he stuck his foot across the bottom of the hoop and I gave him another treat. And so he continued to go back there and put his foot. And finally, he took another step and put his other foot through the hoop. And so there I gave him another treat. And then after this, he didn't know what to do for a while, but finally, just by trial and error, he put both feet through as he had been doing before, and then put uh, also uh, one of his back feet through, so he got a treat there. Uh, he repeated that action because he kind of had figured out the game, and this time, he took another step forward and completely went through the hoop, and so he got a big treat then, because that was a big accomplishment. So the next um, portion of the shaping then was to begin raising the hoop off the ground little by little. And each time he would jump a bit higher through the hoop, then he would get his reinforcement uh, until finally I could hold it up uh, reasonably high like you're seeing on here and he would jump through the thing. So it was a process of small steps and reinforcing these small steps towards the target behavior, what we call shaping or the method of successive approximations. In operant conditioning, we also may have something known as a discriminative stimulus. Now notice this is different than stimulus uh, discrimination that you had with classical conditioning. So it's important to uh, distinguish between those two terms that are awfully similar. Discriminative stimulus is a stimulus that indicates that reinforcement is available if a particular response is made at that time. Okay, so you might say this is an antecedent to a behavior that produces a consequence, antecedent, something that precedes it and indicates that this is the time to perform that behavior. For example, you have the green traffic light. So this is a discriminative stimulus. And what behavior does it tell you to do? Cross the street or cross the intersection now. And what is the rewarding consequence to that? Well, if you cross when it's green, you're not so likely to get run over. You uh, make your way across safely. And so uh, as you do this and you find that it works, you will be more likely to cross when it's green in the future. Now, there are all kinds of other uh, discriminative stimuli as well. Going back to the Skinner box or operant chamber, Remember I said, well, they might have some other stimuli in here like a light or a speaker. Okay, these can be used as discriminative stimuli. So suppose you want the rat to only press the lever for food when the light is on. How can you get the rat to do that? Well, first of all, you have to train, to, train it to press the lever for food. Then once it knows to, how to do that, then what you do is you use the light as a discriminative stimulus and you only provide uh, dispense the food when the rat presses the lever and the light is on when the light is off the rat presses the lever as many times as it wants but it doesn't produce any food reinforcement so what the rat will learn to do then is just only press the lever when the light is on you might say it's learned that pressing the lever when the light is dark does not produce anything. So discriminative stimuli are all over the place for us humans and regulate when we do uh, various things. For example, deadlines, um, school deadlines uh, are discriminative stimuli. And what do they tell you? Well, 
uh, tell you that's the time to do your paper before the deadline because after the deadline, the professor is not going to give you credit for it. Uh, descriptive stimuli, uh, another one, an open sign in the shop window. Yeah, and if it says open, you know, ah, I can go in and maybe get something that I want, but if it's not lit, oh, well, I guess there's no point in going up to the door there because they're probably closed. Or think about maybe you're walking across campus and there's this wonderful aroma coming from the cafeteria. And so that's a discriminative stimulus telling you that, hey, if you go in there now and you engage in a certain behavior, paying your money, that you can get some delicious food as a consequence. Now, having said that, if it was an ugly smell coming out of there, that might tell you, yeah, you can go in there, pay your money and get some punishment as a consequence, something that tastes bad. So these discriminative stimuli though, regulate when we do things to a great extent. Now, let's talk a little bit more about reinforcement. I've used the term a few times, but let's make it clear what that's all about. So reinforcement is a situation where behavior is strengthened by the consequences that it produces. So no matter how this happens, behavior is strengthened. When we say strengthened, what do we mean by that? The behavior is more likely to be repeated in the future. It occurs more often. It occurs sooner. It occurs with more intensity. Any of those things are indication the behavior has been strengthened. Reinforcement can occur in two different ways. Now, be clear that whether it is positive or negative reinforcement, the result is the behavior is being strengthened. It's just how the behavior is being strengthened. So think of positive and negative when it comes to reinforcement like mathematical terms. So the positive sign, the plus sign in math says what? Add, right? Uh, add. So in positive reinforcement, what is occurring is a desirable stimulus is being given as a result of behavior. So the child cleans up their room, mom gives them a hug, okay? So something's being given to them or added. Or you work all week and they give you a paycheck and something's being added, something's being added to your wealth. Uh, again, the result must be that the behavior is strengthened. So in this case, it only is reinforcement if the child continues to, cl to clean up their room or you continue to work there. Now, negative reinforcement throws people off. Keep in mind, negative reinforcement still means the behavior is being strengthened. How? By taking away something. So negative reinforcement, think of the minus negative sign in math tells you to take away, subtract something. Negative reinforcement removes something unpleasant removes a, an aversive stimulus. So a uh, classic example, uh, if you borrow a friend's car, you've never driven the thing before and they're not with you, you get in there and you start it up and immediately you start hearing this annoying bell that's constantly going. And so, you don't know what to do, but it's annoying, right? It's an, it's an aversive stimulus. And so what are you going to do? You're going to start trying various things to get rid of that sound. You don't know what's causing it. So maybe you try checking, turning this knob, you know, turning the lights off. No, it's not that. Uh, maybe it's the turn signal. No, it's not that. Uh, this and that. You try different things. Finally you try fastening the seat belt and the annoying sound stops. Ah, perfect, peace and quiet. And so what are you more likely to do the next time you hop in that vehicle? You're more likely to buckle that seat belt and do it sooner because you know it's gonna relieve you of that uh, disgusting noise. Not disgusting, but mm, uh, unpleasant. Right? 
So negative reinforcement strengthens the behavior by taking away something. Here's another example. Um, suppose you've got a headache, which is an aversive stimulus, yes? Uh, hopefully, if you're normal, that's going to be unpleasant, right? So someone says, here, I've got an aspirin. Why don't you try that? So you do. You try the aspirin, and lo and behold, your headache goes away. What are you more likely to do now the next time you get a headache? Look for an aspirin because it worked before, okay? So notice, again, the aspirin-taking behavior has been strengthened because taking it removed that unpleasant situation. So negative reinforcement always starts out with the person experiencing some aversive stimulus and finding something that takes it away. Now when we talk about reinforcement, remember we have to consider it strengthens the behavior. So here we got this little meerkat guy. And so on a cold day, we can reinforce behaviors that we want it to do by giving it an opportunity to stand in the heat lamp when it has performed those behaviors. But you know what? Will that be effective on a hot day? No, we won't be able to reinforce and strengthen behaviors with this method because a heat lamp is not reinforcing on hot days. So whenever we're trying to use reinforcement, we have to determine just what will be reinforcing uh, at this point in time. Uh, another example of that uh, is a piece of uh, a delicious piece of pie reinforcing. And you say, well, of course. Well, what about if you're at grandma's house Thanksgiving and you've been stuffed full of turkey and rayano and uh, uh, tamales and you name it and all that stuff that we're gonna have at Thanksgiving and you're so stuffed and then they come out with pie. <laughs> Can grandma get you to uh, do something uh, to eat pie at that moment? No, because you're so stuffed, you can't possibly eat another bite, right? So it's not reinforcing at that point in time. So we have to figure that out. Now, let's say you're trying to reinforce a certain behavior with maybe a young child. And you might say, ah, hey, you know what? <laughs> Candy's reinforcing for kids, right? Yeah, well, maybe, but does every kid like every kind of candy? Not necessarily. So maybe what you would do in this situation is you would offer them several kinds of candy to find out which would be the most reinforcing and whichever one they're going to pick, that's the one you're going to use. It's most likely to be effective. Okay, now we can also distinguish between primary and conditioned reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are naturally reinforcing. They usually have something to do with our survival, uh, like food, water, um, sleep when we're tired. Um, these things don't have to be learned. They're just built in. Okay, so like food when we're hungry, uh, liquids when we're thirsty, sleep when we're tired, well, sex if you haven't had any for a long time, you get the idea. Conditioned reinforcers, on the other hand, are learned reinforcers. They, uh, they gain their reinforcing power by being associated with a primary reinforcer. So things like what? Um, praise, applause, mm, money. These are all conditioned reinforcers. And you say, well, wait a minute, what about money? Isn't money naturally reinforcing? Well, if you think about it, no, not really. You take a little baby that hasn't had any experience with money and all it is to them is something that they can stuff up their nose or tear up, right? Um, so they have learned by association that money has some value, that money in fact can produce a primary reinforcer. Now, let me give you a case in point. When my kids were little years ago, um, they really didn't find money to be reinforcing at all. They really didn't know what it was about. That changed though when they found out if you had this stuff called money and you gave it to the cashier in the store, you could get a primary reinforcer. 
I, I bet you can probably guess what it was. Yes, it was candy. And when they found that out, all of a sudden money became reinforcing. They wanted to have some of that stuff. So I could then say to them, hey, uh, I want you to clean that mess up over there that you left. And when you do, then I'll give you a quarter. And they were happy to do it to get that quarter. The money now became reinforcing and I could modify their behavior using it. Of course, then they got a bit older and then it took a $20 bill. And you, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But notice that, yeah, many things that we find to be reinforcing are actually learned or conditioned reinforcers. We also can distinguish between immediate and delayed reinforcement. Immediate reinforcement uh, is provided instantly after a behavior is performed. For example, a rat receives its food pellet immediately after it presses the lever. Or you uh, find that the light comes on immediately after you flip the switch. Now, when we have immediate reinforcement, we will get more consistent conditioning. On the other hand, delayed reinforcement, there's a time lapse before reinforcement is provided. With animals, that may become ineffective even after very short delays, even delays of a couple seconds or more, such that we are not able to actually reinforce the intended behavior, produce the conditioning response that we are trying to get. In humans, um, we may have some success with that because humans can engage in a delay of gratification. Uh, they can think ahead into the future, and so for some uh, future reinforcement, they may continue to uh, work for that uh, with a delay in the reinforcement. Now, delayed reinforcement also then may produce superstitious behaviors of various kinds. Um, maybe you think about baseball players. Yeah, some baseball players are a little superstitious. They have to wear a certain pair of socks for an important game. They have to put them on. Now, they know full well that it's ridiculous. It's silly <laughs> that it really doesn't do anything, but they feel like they have to do it anyways. Superstitious, right? They say, well, how did they get like that? Well, most likely what happened is at some point in the past, they put on that pair of socks, maybe it was a brand new pair of socks, and a few hours later, they hit a home run in the game or their team won a big game. And so their nervous system has made a connection between them putting those socks on, those particular socks, and succeeding in the game. Now, this also occurs in animal training as well. Uh, one time I had a cat that I was training to do something. I wanted the cat to stand up uh, on command in order to receive its food. And so I had pretty well trained, I thought. It was standing up consistently when I asked it to do so and receiving a bit of food each time. And I was practicing this with the cat. And at one point, uh, as, after I said stand up and the cat stood up, the doorbell rang. And so I went over to answer the door and then a few minutes later realized that the cat had stood up and hadn't received its reinforcement. So I went and gave it the, uh, the piece of food. Now in the meantime, the cat had walked back, back and forth a few times waiting for the food. I again continued practicing with the cat and the very next try, the phone rang as soon as I said stand up and the cat stood up. And as I answered the phone, the cat walked back and forth waiting for its reinforcement. And a few minute, a few seconds later, I remembered, oh yeah, got to give the cat its reinforcement. So I gave it to it. What I found after that, when I'd asked the cat to stand up, uh, from time to time, instead of standing up right away, what would the cat do? It would, have you guessed it, walk back and forth, which is what it was doing when we had a delay in reinforcement. So I had inadvertently reinforced 
the walking behavior that the cat was doing before I gave the reinforcement when that delay occurred. So we see how we may end up actually uh, reinforcing other behaviors when there's delay in reinforcement. Now, one of the things to think about then is, well, let me back up a bit. They have found in research that people will prefer a small but immediate reinforcement over a larger but delayed reinforcement. So people will prefer uh, $1 now than uh, getting $2 if they're gonna have to wait three weeks to get their $2. People will tend to pick the smaller but more immediate reinforcement. So here's a question for you. Why do we often prefer to sit and watch TV, which provides small amount of reinforcement when we should study for a larger reinforcement? So the scenario is you want to, you want to get a high grade in a class. It's really important. You want to get an A. And so it's a big goal for you. You really want to get that A really bad. But then you find yourself sitting there watching TV when you should be studying for the class. Why is that happening? Well, think about it. When do you get the reinforcement with your big goal of getting an A in the class? You don't get the reinforcement till the semester's over and you see that A on your report card. So you have a large but delayed reinforcement. Now, why watch TV then instead of studying? Well, hmm, studying is maybe not all that reinforcing. Watching TV might provide a small but immediate reinforcement. So we tend to go for that smaller immediate reinforcement. Now, how can you overcome this? Because I'm sure almost every of you have run into this or something similar. Well, one of the things that we can do is that we can set up smaller but more frequent reinforcements along the way to our goal. So we can set it up where, oh, how about this? Ah, after we've studied for a set period of time each day, then we get to watch that TV program that we want. That works really well. In fact, it's the thing that you do instead of the thing that you're supposed to do that you can then use as reinforcement. It tends to be one of the most powerful ones. So maybe it's for you, it's not watching TV. Maybe for you, it's uh, you know, playing with your, uh, with your dog or something like that. Then make the reinforcement for the studying that thing that you always tend to do instead of it. That's really good. So you have what? More frequent and immediate reinforcements uh, going on. Now, you can do some other things as well to overcome this same thing. And one of these would be to change the response cost, as they call it. So we can make the effort involved with watching TV to be greater and the effort involved in studying to be less. Uh, in fact, one psychology professor actually did this at home with his family, and what he did is he set it up where in order to watch TV, you first had to ride this exercise bike in order to charge up a battery before the TV would work. And so he increased the response cost of watching TV, and lo and behold, he and the family members watched less TV but exercised more. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, so you can make it more difficult to watch TV. You can also make it easier to study. So you can have all your books set up where it's easy to get to them and uh, make it a, you know, a comfortable, inviting place to sit down and study. And maybe you can put on some non-distracting background music that's pleasant. So uh, again, you know, uh, that's going to encourage you to study uh, rather than do something else. Um, and then there's also, um, there's also the social animal. We'll talk about social learning later, but you know, um, yeah, 
if uh, you do it together with somebody else, that makes it more likely as well, uh, because it's rewarding to hear your friends say uh, that they're glad that you're studying with them and so forth. So there's a bunch of stuff, but notice that, yeah, this is one of the typical things we have to overcome. The lure of small reinforcements that are immediate as opposed to larger but delayed reinforcement. Okay, so moving on, reinforcement schedules. At the most basic level, you have continuous versus partial reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement occurs every time the behavior is exhibited. So every time the rat presses the lever, it gets a pellet of food. That's continuous reinforcement. Or every time you flip the light switch, the light comes on. So what we get with continuous reinforcement is rapid conditioning. The new behavior will be learned, will, uh, be learned very quickly. Um, the downside, though, is you also get rapid extinction of the behavior. So if the behavior occurs and it does not produce the reinforcement, the person or animal will stop doing that particular action uh, very quickly over time. The other is partial or intermittent reinforcement. Matter of fact, that's a word that really ought to be on there. Let me see if I could, I wonder if I can type it on here. Yeah, hey, I might be able to just do that, okay? Intermittent, okay, reinforcement. Same thing as partial reinforcement. So intermittent or partial reinforcement is provided only sometimes when the behavior is exhibited. So when the rat presses the lever, the food comes out only sometimes, not every time. Or when you uh, flip the light switch, it comes on sometimes, but other times it doesn't come on. So what we get with partial reinforcement is slower acquisition of a new behavior. However, behaviors that have been reinforced under this partial or intermittent pattern are more resistant to extinction. So if there is no reinforcement for a time, the person or animal will keep doing that behavior more times before they stop doing it if it has been under partial reinforcement. We also can get higher rates of responding with partial reinforcement as well. Okay, so um, one example of this, um, higher rates of responding. So if I'm working with my dog who knows how to do uh, a few different tricks and I'm practicing them with him, I can get him to do those more rapidly if I use partial reinforcement and don't give him a treat every time he does something. So why does it work that way? Well, there's a couple reasons. After the dog has uh, picked up on the reinforcement pattern, he realizes that he has to do more tricks in order to get the reinforcement. So the faster he does it, the sooner he gets his reinforcement. And there's another element too, when it comes to reinforcement that's consumable like treats, dog treats, I also don't have to stop each time and wait for him to take the treat and swallow it before I can go on to the next. So between those two things, I can get him to work faster by using partial reinforcement. Now, we can use a combination of these two approaches then to quickly um, produce a new learned behavior and then to make it resistant to extinction. So let's say you want to get your little brother to put the toilet seat down every time he uses the bathroom. So how are you going to get him to do it? Well, you find out that he likes M&Ms. In fact, that's his favorite thing in the world. And so then what you do is each time that he goes to the bathroom and he actually puts the seat down, you give him an M&M or two. So you are using continuous reinforcement 
to establish this new behavior. So you continue to do this until he becomes very consistent at putting the seat down. And then you might go a little bit longer with it just to make sure that that new behavior is well established. Now you move to making it more resistant to extinction because you don't want to follow him around the rest of his life providing him M&Ms every time he goes to the bathroom. And so what you do is you begin to thin out the reinforcement. And so maybe every third time that he does it right, you skip the reinforcement. Then you skip it every second time. Then you skip it every other time and so on and so forth until finally he's doing it many times without reinforcement with just occasional reinforcement. And eventually it sort of becomes a habit, okay? In fact, at that time, you may be able to actually maintain that behavior by simply complimenting um, him on that um, after a time. So notice how uh, using these two approaches together can be very effective. Okay, <laughs> now I can't get to the next one. Hello, I wanna go to the next one. All I'm doing is, <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so I can't get rid of an intermittent reinforcement on the screen now. Let me see if I can get it off. Ah. Well, I'll just leave it there, ignore it. Okay, so the then more refined uh, schedules involve two types. We have ratio schedules. Ratio schedules, are based on the number of behaviors that must be performed to, pro, uh, to provide reinforcement. So it's based on number. Interval schedules, on the other hand, involve a certain time interval that must elapse before the reinforcement is provided. Okay, it sounds confusing, but I'll explain it. So we have a fixed ratio schedule. So in this case, the behavior produces reinforcement only after a fixed exact number of responses have been made, okay? So always the same number of responses must be made. So we might have a situation where there's a sales bonus every time the salesperson has made five sales. Well, that's a fixed ratio schedule of five. Or we might have a token economy where the child gets a star on the chart uh, every time that they have uh, uh, done their, their homework for five uh, homeworks in a row or something like that. Um, oh, <laughs> if, uh, if you've played Quizlet uh, live, oh, we haven't played that. Okay, but any games where you have to move a certain number of spaces is a fixed ratio schedule. Okay, um, here's another one, fixed ratio schedule. Um, I went to this place to get the oil changed in my vehicle and they gave me something to put on my keychain and it had one, two, three, four, and then it had Guess what? After four oil change, I get a free oil change. And so this was a fixed ratio schedule of five, okay? Have to always go four times. Oops, it was four. <laughs> it was four, okay? All right, you get the idea. Now, we also have variable ratio schedules. So in this case, yes, the behavior has to be performed a certain number of times, but it can't be predicted how many times that's going to be, okay? So many games of chance gambling fall under this variable ratio schedule. So the slot machine, how many times do you have to play the slot machine to win? I don't know, you know, or how about playing the lottery? How many times, how many lottery tickets do you have to buy to win? And who knows? Um, it might be the next one, or you might have to keep buying and buying them, right? Yeah, you can look on there and it'll tell you the odds of winning, but that doesn't tell you how many you actually are gonna have to buy. Um, another example would be fishing casts. So 
how many times do you have to cast that bait out there until you get a fish? And they say, I don't know. It might be the next cast, or I might have to do it all day. Might have to do it hundreds of times. <clears throat> so variable racial schedule. Now, when we have behavior that's under a variable racial schedule, it results in very persistent behavior. That's why people get hooked on games of chance, uh, gambling, or <laughs> fishing, become very persistent at it. Another element of these racial schedules is shown on this chart here. Again, ignore intermittent reinforcement. Um, here we have the number of responses that uh, a rat made pressing a lever for food over um, certain periods of time. And so what you'll notice is the rat made what? Many, many responses in a very short time when under either ratio schedule, whether it was variable or fixed ratio. So we also get very rapid responding uh, people and animals will work very fast under uh, fixed and variable ratio schedules. Okay, now let's go to the interval schedules. So interval schedules, the reinforcement does not appear until a certain time has elapsed. The behavior can be performed uh, once or many times within that interval period, uh, but Nonetheless, nothing is provided until that time interval is over. So fixed interval schedule, the reinforcement occurs always after a specified time. So one example of this would be scheduled exams, okay? When do you get the reinforcement with scheduled exams? Well, not until the day the exam is given, and you've taken the exam, right? You can't get it until then. You can study as much or as little until then, but um, you only get reinforcement for your studying behavior once the exam is given. Now, another example of this um, fixed interval schedule would be making jello. Now, what you're going to see is fixed interval schedules tend to produce a certain uh, pattern of responding. And if you look at the chart here, fixed interval schedules, the black slash lines are when reinforcement is being given. Okay. So let's use making jello as an example. Okay. So how do you make jello? Well, you mix up this soup, right? and then you put it in the refrigerator, and then what do you do? Well, you have to wait. So how long do you have to wait? Well, it depends on your refrigerator, right? But if your refrigerator is consistent, it's a fixed amount of time. Maybe it's 20 minutes with a particular refrigerator. You don't get to eat the Jello until that time limit is up, right? So kids who haven't been around making Jello what'll they do? They'll start opening the refrigerator as soon as you put it in there, because they're not familiar with it. But if they've been around it, they're familiar with the reinforcement schedule. They know that you have to wait. So what will they do? First minutes, they don't monkey around with the door. They don't open it. But as the time for reinforcement gets closer and closer, they have a tendency more and more to open that door up and look in there hoping to get reinforcement. And that's very typical of fixed interval schedules. As the time for reinforcement approaches, the behavior accelerates. Oh, think about that. With scheduled exams, does it work like that? Oh yeah, I can remember when I was a student, when I finished one exam, what did I do? Slam the book closed and said, ah, I can rest for a while now. And uh, maybe I went to class uh, a little bit, but I wasn't doing too much until the next exam was approaching. And then as it got closer, then I said, oh, maybe I better start reading. Maybe I better start reviewing my notes a little, but uh, it's a week away. I'm not going to do too much. And the day, two days before, uh, now I'm going to pull it out and look, a little, look at it a little more. 
Uh, the day before, uh-oh, I'm spending more time. Yeah, an hour before the exam, boy, I'm cramming there and really going at it, trying to get ready. Yeah, isn't that very typical? So notice how, yeah, that tends to produce this same pattern, okay? Now, we also have the variable interval schedule. In this case, the reinforcement does not occur until some time period has elapsed, but it is unpredictable just when that time period is going to actually end, okay? So what we have here as an example, how about pop quizzes? Yeah, so how do you get reinforcement with a pop quiz? Well, you don't know when it's coming up, so you just have to kind of keep up with things in the class, right? Um, so what we get also then is kind of just slow and steady responding. So where there's a pop quiz gonna be coming up in a class, then people just kind of try to keep up with stuff so when that quiz comes that they'll have some idea what's going on. Slow and steady responding. Uh, some other examples of behaviors that would be on a variable interval schedule. How about surprise safety inspections, okay? So maybe you know that the inspector comes out twice a year to inspect the safety equipment, but you don't know exactly when they're coming. And so once again, how do you get reinforcement under these circumstances? Well, you just keep the safety equipment in good repair constantly and check it periodically and then you're ready. So you notice you're not just running around like crazy trying to get ready for that because you don't know when they're coming. You just keep things going. So this whole business of reinforcement schedules can be very useful if you work with people and you need to uh, get them to produce something. So if you're a teacher, a coach, um, if you're a manager, it's kind of important to know something about these schedules of reinforcement to get the best results with your people. Um, let me tell you about a cool job I had once. I had this job while I was a college student during the summer. I didn't take courses during the summer. I just tried to make a bunch of money so that I'd have enough money to buy uh, pizza or whatever and pay for tuition uh, during the next year. Yeah, not so much pizza, more tuition. But anyways, uh, the way this job worked, uh, it was farm work, and uh, they had us working out on this remote uh, part of the farm. And out there all summer, uh, everybody knew the boss never shows up except for Friday afternoon. Never shows up till then. So <laughs> Monday, what are we doing out there? <laughs> Nothing, messing around. Tuesday, not really much of anything. Wednesday, uh, maybe we better think about getting some of this work done. Thursday, uh-oh, boss is coming tomorrow. We better get with it. Uh, uh, let's get going, yeah. And then Friday morning, yeah, everybody is scrambling to get everything done because, yeah, boss is coming this afternoon. Now. What's the point here? <laughs> if you are a manager, boss, coach, teacher, and you want your people you're supervising to put in uh, work steadily and work uh, consistently, uh, what's the best way to actually get that to happen? Oh, by the way, uh, what schedule was that? that I had at that job. It was a fixed interval schedule where after you get your reinforcement, yeah, you don't do much until the next reinforcement is approaching. So that wasn't a very good way to do it. It's better if we want our people to be uh, working constantly to use a variable interval schedule. So how would you do that? As a manager, you just what? Pop in at random times so that they can't predict when you're gonna come. And this then uh, will have people continuing to work consistently. 
Okay. Now, some of you might say, well, but hey, I could get them to produce more work, get more done if I put them on a ratio schedule. Now, that's true. That is true. However, there may be some drawbacks to having your um, uh, athletes or workers or students on a ratio schedule. Um, one is that you have to be careful that you don't end up getting sloppy work because just to what complete more and to get the reinforcement, now we rush to get everything done. Um, we also have to watch out that, in fact, uh, some individuals will work so hard and so fast under ratio schedules that they'll sort of burn themselves out. Yeah, and then they'll have to be replaced because they no longer want to do it, they just get burned out. So if it's difficult to replace them or costly to replace them, uh, then we might want to think more on the lines of maybe a variable interval schedule. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff of uh, schedules reinforcement. And I think that almost does it. We have one more big topic to pick up, and that is the topic of punishment. So punishment is associated also with operant conditioning. This is a process by which a behavior is weakened by the consequence it produces. So the consequence of that behavior then causes it to occur less frequently, to be delayed, uh, causes it to be engaged in less intensely. Any of those things indicate a weakening of that behavior. Oh, I should mention uh, ceases entirely would be another example of weakening of a behavior. Punishment also can occur in two different ways. Okay, and we can have what's known as positive punishment. Again, think of the plus sign for positive, like in math, that says add something. So something is being given, in this case, an aversive stimulus, something unpleasant. So a child misbehaves and they are given a spanking or you park in the wrong place and you're given a parking ticket. Now, if indeed that results in a weakening of the behavior, if the child no longer does the misbehavior for which they got the spanking or you no longer park in that place, uh, then we can say this has served as punishment. Negative punishment involves think minus sign in math, taking away something, in this case, something desirable. So um, time out. Yeah, so a child misbehaves and now they take away their privilege to play with their toys and their friends and take away the privilege to do anything interesting. Yeah, uh, if that again weakens the behavior that preceded it, this has served as punishment, negative variety. Uh, or the person drives recklessly and they revoke, take away the person's driver's license. If when they get behind the wheel again, they no longer drive recklessly, we can say this is served as a punishment, negative form of it. Okay, now notice we're, when we say positive or negative, we're not saying good or bad, we're just saying how the weakening of behavior has occurred, positive by adding something unpleasant, negative by taking away something desirable, okay? But either way, it's weakening behavior. Now, let me ask you a question. Does, uh, what about um, person being put in prison? Is that punishment? Now, your first response is likely to be, well, of course that's punishment. But think in psychologist terms. So psychologist terms, punishment weakens behavior. So to be considered punishment uh, in terms of psychology, we'd have to say, well, does the um, prison sentence, does it weaken criminal behavior? Now, if the person goes to prison and after they're released, they commit crimes less than before or not at all, 
we can say, yes, it actually served as punishment because it weakened criminal behavior. Does that always happen though? No, sometimes people go to prison and when they get out, they commit crimes just as they did before. And in some cases, people even get out of prison and actually commit more and worse crimes than they did beforehand based on some of the associations they've made uh, when in prison. So in this case, in fact, we could say that the prison sentence didn't serve as a punishment, but actually reinforced criminal behavior. So remember, we have to look at the results in psychology to determine is something reinforcement or is it punishment? So let's talk a little bit about the use of punishment as a way to modify behavior. So when we're trying to change other people's behaviors, uh, punishment is often one of the first things that people think of. However, we should be aware of some of the downsides of punishment. One is that punishment does not extinguish undesirable behavior. It rather suppresses the undesirable behavior so long as there is some threat of punishment. Now here's a case in point. So a driver has received a speeding ticket in McAllen, let's say. So when they're in McAllen, they don't drive uh, above the speeding uh, speed limit anymore. But they find themselves out in the middle of Brooks County and they know there's not but two sheriff's deputies in the whole county and they're out in those back roads and there's nobody around for miles and what are they doing? They're speeding along, breaking the speed limit because there's no real threat of punishment. So keep that in mind. Um, it doesn't extinguish that undesirable behavior. In fact, it may be waiting to resurface as soon as there's no threat of punishment. Another thing that we should know is that punishment does not teach new and desirable behavior. It only teaches what not to do. So let's take a, an example here. Let's say you have a two-year-old child, right? It's a two-year-old and they are running out into the street in front of speeding cars and buses and trucks. Yeah, we might uh, use some punishment to suppress that behavior quickly because it's very dangerous, life-threatening behavior, and punishment will do that, uh, at least if it's of sufficient intensity. Maybe not as intense as you might think, but at any rate, so we might use some punishment to get that stopped quickly. However, does that teach the child how to safely cross the street? No, it doesn't. We have to what? We have to teach them that using reinforcement. So we have to say, okay, now here's what you do. You, you wait until mom or dad's there and you take our hand. And then when we go, you go. Or when they get a little older, you look both ways. That's the way, see, and we, reinforce that with some praise. Now you're doing it right, okay? So know that the punishment doesn't teach them what to do, it only teaches them what not to do. We also should know that uh, punishment may produce fear, dislike, avoidance, or retaliation against the person who is administering the punishment. So, these sort of outcomes may be things that we don't want to uh, risk in a particular relationship. Uh, and maybe it's important that that relationship be one of trust and so forth. So we might then think of other ways to modify that behavior uh, if we're not willing to uh, risk those outcomes. We also should know that punishment is readily imitated especially by children. And for example, years ago, they did an experiment where an adult was in charge of a game that children were playing. And when children broke the rules of the game, the adult administered a punishment. The child lost their turn on the next round. Then they allowed each of the children to take turns being in charge of the game. And what happened? <laughs> They imitated the punitive behavior of the adult and did the very same thing 
when other kids broke the rules. And so they readily imitated the adult's behavior. So if we don't want to risk that, then again, we should think of some other ways to modify that behavior. And finally, we tend to be over-reliant on punishment to modify behavior. Um, in fact, that may be the first thing we think of because it's been so much a part of our past. Uh, but in fact, there can be ways that we can use reinforcement to produce good behavior that in fact may crowd out the undesirable behavior. Now, let me give you um, a case in point. Okay, how about this? Which professor would you prefer? Professor who uh, punishes you for coming late to class with um, uh, docs your grade for coming late? Or would you prefer the professor that rewards you with some extra points when you come on time? And most of you say, well, I prefer the professor that is uh, uh, using reinforcement to uh, encourage being on time. Uh, I don't think I'd like the professor as much that punishes people when they don't make it. Yeah, so here's an example of how you can use reinforcement rather than punishment to um, encourage desirable behavior. So think about that a bit next time that you are tempted to use punishment to modify another person's behavior, could you use reinforcement to increase their desirable behavior? Okay, so there you go. And, oops, I'm going backwards. That'll do it for today. So hope you're having a great day and we'll stop it there. There'll be one more video that'll talk about social learning and uh, other types of learning and that'll be it for that uh, topic.